This is Math 151, and man, things are going to get good now. So we're going to talk about uh, derivatives of inverse functions. So just a little reminder about inverse functions. If I have some function f of x, the notation f inverse looks like f to a negative 1 power. f inverse of x is its inverse. These are inverses. Remember inverses, they undo each other. So in other words, if I had this machine called f and let's say I plug a 7 into it it spits out a 3. There is a machine hopefully that undoes it f inverse of x. In other words if I plug a 3 into this I get a 7 back. Notice how the function goes this way and the inverse goes that way. They're both functions it's just they both undo each other. And an implication for that is that f of f inverse of x is x. f inverse of f of x is x. So in other words, like this example right here, if I, if I plug 3 into f of x, I get 7. And if I plug that 7 into f, I get the 3 back. I get my original input back because they undo each other. So I'm going to have some function f. And just for notation's sake, I'm going to let some other function that I'm going to call g be its inverse. So g is the inverse of f. f and g undo each other. So remember, that means if I go f of g of x, I get x back. Plug x into g, plug that answer into f. It undoes it. I get the x back. So I know then also of f of x is x. Right? It doesn't matter what order I do it. They, they undo each other. And so now I'm going to build on this. So g of f of x is, is x. If I plug x into f, plug that in g, I get x back. I'm going to take the derivative of both sides. So on the right-hand side, the derivative of x is just 1, right? Like x to the first tower, bring it down, reduce by 1, 1 times x to the 0. Now on the left-hand side, I've got a chain rule. f is inside of g. Derivative of the outside function of what it's taking was being input into it. Now I've taken the derivative of the g, now I take the input of what's uh, the derivative of, of the input times. Um, this is just some value, this is some value. So notice one thing that I can do here is I can divide both sides. And what that gives me is the derivative of f is 1 over the derivative of g of f of x. That right there is a relationship we're going to hinge a lot of uh, today's lecture on. So here, what I did was I just substituted back in g uh, derivative. g is the inverse of f. So the derivative of g is the derivative of the inverse of f. It's a lot to keep track of here. So this is what uh, this is telling me. The derivative of a function is 1 over the function plugged into the, the derivative of its inverse. Uh, similarly, si since f and f inverses are inverses of each other, I could say a function's derivative is equal to the reciprocal, that means just 1 divided by, the reciprocal of itself plugged into the derivative of its inverse. And similarly, this is saying the same thing. The derivative of the inverse of a function is the reciprocal of itself, right? Itself being the inverse plugged into the derivative of the function. So what you say? <laughs> well, it actually gives us a bit of power. It's just another derivative tool for us. So what I want to do is find the derivative of g. The derivative of it is itself plugged into the derivative of its inverse, 1 divided by that. I'm just going to tell you that the inverse of this is uh, 2 over x minus 1. That would have been an exercise from like 141 or 142, I forget which class. The derivative of the inverse, well this is a quotient. 
So it would be, if I write it out, derivative of the numerator minus derivative of the denominator times the numerator over the denominator squared. So the derivative of, uh, of a constant is zero. So that's, that's just a zero there. And the derivative of x is 1, so this is negative 1 times 2, so a negative 2 up here over x minus 1 squared. All right, so we have all our pieces. We have the derivative of the inverse, bada boom, and we have the function itself. So notice the, the derivative of the function is 1 over, I'm going to plug the function itself into the derivative of the inverse, right? So that x right there is my input spot. So I'm just going to highlight, I'm going to do this in a different color just so you can kind of see it. So g inverse, the derivative of g inverse is negative 2 over some input minus 1 squared. And my input is the original function. So x plus 2 over x. So I have this big compound function to deal with. So 1 over, and let me mess around with this. So um, I'm going to add these together, x minus x plus 2 over x minus 1. I need a common denominator, which would be x over x. So 1 is x over x. So this would be um, x plus 2 minus x over x squared x minus x is 0, so this is 1 over negative 2 over uh, 2 over x squared. And 2 over x squared is, is 4 over x squared. And now let me think about this. This is negative 2 uh, divided by 4 over x squared, so that would be the same as negative 2 times x over x squared over 4, those cancel out, so this would be, there's a 2 there, so that would be x squared, negative x squared over 2, and that is under the 1 still, uh, so it's 1 over negative x squared over 2, so then if I, uh, you know, it's 1 divided by that, so if I take the reciprocal of that, it's negative 2 over x squared. Wow, that's a bear getting there. Right, so this is not the way I would find uh, find the derivative of this. I could just use the quotient rule, and I'll, I'll get the same answer. But I wanted you to show you this relationship and and how it works. So here's a little application for this. Um, H of x is the cube root of x, and we want to find uh, the derivative. Whoops, not the inverse. We want to find the derivative of that. So we actually um, haven't talked about how do we do a square root or cube root with derivatives. Um, and this will actually lead to a shortcut, uh, a shortcut, a relationship, I should say. So I know that the derivative of a function is the same as 1 over, I'm thinking about this, its inverse's derivative with itself plugged into it. So let's see, if, if h of x is the cube root of x, its inverse, the thing that undoes cube rooting, is cubing. And I know how to find the derivative of that. Just that power rule, bring down the 3, uh, reduce the exponent by 1. If I wanted to find this, it would be 1 over, so I'm going to plug this h of x into the derivative of its inverse. So 3 times some input squared, my input happens to be the cube root of x. Now cube roots can be expressed as fractional exponents, like x to the one-third means cube root. So I'm going to rewrite this as x to the one-third power. So this is the same as 1 over 3 power to a power, you can just multiply x to the two-thirds. There's two ways I can express this. 
um, 1 over 3. This x is being squared. That's what the, the 2 in the numerator tells me. And cube rooted. Could write it like that. Or I could just write it as 1 third x to the negative 2 thirds. Remember the negative uh, means divide by that, so it pushes it down to the denominator. That's that. I could do this again with like a, a different power. Let's do it with the seventh. Uh, seventh root of x. What times itself seven times would give you x is what that's asking. Well, we're going to use that. We're going to use that inverse relationship. So the derivative of the inverse with the original function plugged into it, right? One over that, the reciprocal of that. So if j of x is the root 7 of x, its inverse is x to the 7th. The derivative of the inverse, power rule, 7x to the 6th. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to take the original function and plug it into the derivative of the inverse. 1 over 7 times some input to the 6th power. The input happens to be the original function. So, and again, I could write this as x to the 1 7th. Right, this is the same as that. So this would be 1 over 7 x to the 6 7th power, which is the same as 1 7th times x to the negative 6 7th. This extends our power rule for us. Notice when we had had uh, j of x was x to the 1 7th. The inverse of it was 1 7th x to the negative 6 sevenths. You know, in our power rule, we go like bring it down and then subtract 1 from it, it being the, um, the exponent. It's the same thing here. This inverse, like the, the 1 7th gets multiplied by the x. And then here we have the original minus one, which is negative six sevenths. This will true for this will work for any rational exponent. So, like if I had like uh, the fifteenth root of x, x to the one fifteenth. Sorry, I, that should have been derivative. The derivative of it is bring it down, and then reduce this by one. Great, so now I can deal with derivatives of roots. I have a shortcut, and it came out of this, this inverse, a uh, derivatives of inverse functions relationship. So let's use what we know to find the derivative of this, the square root of 8t minus 9. So first off, I'm going to think of uh, 8t minus 9 to the 1 half as the way I'm going to represent that. So now I have a chain rule, right? I have something to the one half power. So I'm going to take first off the derivative of the something to the one half power. So one half the thing, and then this reduced by one is negative one half, multiplied by the derivative of what's inside there. The derivative of eight t minus nine is just eight. So that's multiplied by eight. So let's see, I have, these things are all multiplied together. So uh, 8 times a half is 4. And you know, this is okay like this, but that negative uh, pushes this to the denominator, that negative exponent. And since it's a 1 half power, it's the square root. So I could write it uh, just like that. And just an exercise to help you think about inverses, and finding the derivative of an inverse. And so it's thinking about inverses and thinking about this relationship right here, this derivative of inverse functions relationship. So we want to find uh, the derivative of the inverse of a when these things are true. So we know that the derivative of the inverse of a is 1 over its inverse's derivative, right? The inverse of f inverse is f of just the original function. So we know a is 3. So let's find f inverse of a, uh, of 3. 
Well, let's see. We know that f of 7 is 3. So if we were to plug 7 into f, it would spit out 3. f inverse works backwards. So that means that f inverse of 3 must be 7. All right, here's the answer. That was the question. So we know that. So this value right here is uh, 7. Okay. So 1 over f prime of 7. Oh, that's right here. That's 15. So this answer would be 1 15th. You have some practice like this with the homework. Again, it's just, just practice to help you think about this formula, this relationship, and thinking about um, inverses. All right, here comes the punchline. Uh, g of x is equal to inverse sine of x. And I want to find the derivative of g. Of sine inverse. I haven't seen this before. <laughs> it's like, what do I do? Well, I, what I can do is I can go through this definition that we've just been that we've just been building up. So I know that the derivative of a function is the original function itself plugged into the derivative of its inverse. So I know the function itself is inverse sine. Remember that undoes sine, right? Like, like sine itself takes in an angle, spits out a ratio. So inverse sine takes in a ratio, spits out an angle. So x would be some ratio, and it would spit out some angle that happens at that ratio. So that means that inverse of this would be sine, which makes sense to me. <laughs> sine and sine inverses are inverses of each other. Let's plug this stuff in then. Oh, one more piece. I don't want just the inverse of it. I want the derivative of the inverse. The derivative of sine is cosine. So notice I have a couple of things here. I have the derivative of the inverse, which is cosine. And I also have the original function itself, which is sine inverse. This isn't going to feel necessarily much better. I'm going to take sine inverse that's my g of x, and I'm going to plug it into cosine. So what I'll have is cosine of sine inverse of x. And boy, it feels like, what the heck do I do now? Well, let's think about, again, what these things like sine and cosine mean. Um, inverse sine of x. So if I had some rotation theta, right? Inverse sine takes in the ratio and spits out the angle. So some angle theta, the ratio that I'm inputting is x. Think of that as an x over 1. So remember, um, sine would be like that. Sine of theta opposite over hypotenuse, or y over r. If I'm going inverse sine of this, that would give me this angle theta. So really what I'm trying to find here is cosine of whatever theta is. And I know that cosine is um, adjacent over 1, whatever this side is over 1. And I can get this side by using the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> right? Let me, let, me call it, uh, let me call it A. A squared plus x squared equals 1 squared. This squared plus this squared. So if I subtract, if I solve for a, subtract x squared from both sides, and then square root it. So cosine of theta, then, must equal the square root of 1 minus x squared. Which means that this whole thing is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And that is my derivative. So when I'm taking the derivative of inverse sine, of arc sine, I get something that doesn't even have trig functions in it anymore, right? It's equivalent to, to 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. Now, if you want to pause, rewind, relook at that explanation um, just to, to see it, it's, it's glorious. Um, take, take your time with it. Like, it is worth it to dig into this. 
So let's do this again for tangent. In other words, I'm going to find the derivative of arctan, of, of the inverse of tangent, and see what it is. I know that h of x is inverse tangent, so the inverse of h must be tangent. So I need to find the derivative of this, because I know that the derivative of h is 1 over, 1 over itself plugged into the derivative of its inverse. Well, tangent is sine over cosine. So if I want to find the derivative of that, that is going to be a quotient rule. Derivative of the numerator times the denominator minus derivative of the denominator times the numerator all over the denominator squared. Uh, derivative of sine is cosine, so this becomes cosine squared. Derivative of cosine is negative sine, so negative times a negative is positive. This becomes plus sine squared over cosine squared, which is a uh, Pythagorean identity there, 1 over cosine squared x. So the derivative of the inverse of h is 1 over cosine squared. I'm going to leave it as that. I'm not going to rewrite it as like um, secant. That's this part. And h of x, the original function, is just inverse tangent. 1 over, that's this part. I'm going to plug h of x into the derivative of, of h inverse. So this would be 1 over cosine squared of. All right, so let's deal with this thing. Let's deal with this cosine squared of inverse tangent of x. Same thing, uh, inverse tangent takes in a ratio, spits out an angle. So I have some angle, and my ratio is x, which is x over 1. So theta would be rise over run, y over x, opposite over adjacent. So inverse tangent of x would be theta, and I can get this by Pythagorean theorem, and you can see that it's, it's uh, the square root of 1 squared plus x squared. And so notice, um, cosine squared is cosine of theta squared. And cosine of theta would be adjacent over hypotenuse. And if I square that, the squaring takes care of that square root. So this is 1 over 1 over, and then this is that 1 over 1 plus x squared. <laughs> so that's going to get flipped a couple of times. Um, 1 divided by just this part right here is 1 divided by 1 over 1 plus x squared. So that flips it. So this becomes 1 plus x squared. And there it is right there. That is my uh, derivative of tangent. So here they all are. And um, you can, can work to, to know these. These are things to, to know. Um, I have just like... I just have a, a note that I made that I just will leave up posted when I'm trying to remind myself of these while I'm working with them so I can look them up real quick if I need them. Um, and then that helps me remember them as well. And you'll start to, if you dig in a little bit, you'll start to see some relationships between sine and cosecant, tangent, cotangent, exactly. Ex uh, again, remember these are derivatives of the inverse of each of these trig functions, not of the trig functions themselves. We've already, we've already talked about this. What's nice about this is if we know these, we don't have to go through this every time to get to them. But this allowed us to find them, the, these relationships. So let's do a um, couple of examples like this. So h of x 
So I have some function h defined as arc sine, inverse sine of 2x cubed, and I want to find its derivative. So one thing that I noticed here is that this is, this is a, a chain rule. This is a compound function. This is a function plugged into a function. So what I need to do is find the derivative of the outside piece and then multiply it by the derivative of the inside piece. So let me do that carefully. I'm going to write out steps here. So as I go to find the derivative of arc sine, of inverse sine, I know it's, it's this. It's 1 over square root of 1 minus input squared. So let me start with that. Here's the derivative of arc sine. And that x is my input. So that's my 2x cubed. And since this is chain rule, I then have to multiply that by the derivative of what was in there. So and if I was doing this problem, I probably wouldn't have written out that step. I'd just take the derivative of it right away. But I want to be real explicit about what's going on here. Um, if I square this, this becomes 4x to the 6th times, just power rule here, uh, 6x squared. And if I multiply those together, I get 6x squared over square root of 1 minus 4x to the 6th. That is the derivative. I want to find the derivative of inverse tangent of x over 2. So again, I see that I have a chain rule, right? I have a function plugged inside a function. So I'm going to go derivative of tangent and then multiply it by the derivative of this thing that's plugged into it. So derivative of tangent, 1 over 1 plus input squared. And my input is x over 2. Multiplied by the derivative of x over 2. x over 2 is like 1 half times x. So the derivative of that is 1 half. If I square this, x squared over 4. So I'm going to simplify this, clean it up a little bit. 1 times 1 is 1. Uh, distribute this 2 into here. I have 2 plus x squared over 2. You know, and that's okay, but I don't, I'm going to clean, I don't like this compound fraction. So I'm going to go 1 over, a common denominator for these would be 2. So I'm going to think of this as 4 over 2. I'm doing this so I can add these together. 4 plus x squared over 2. And then, uh, since it's 1 divided by that, that would be the reciprocal, 2 over x squared plus 4. That is the derivative for that. So uh, y equals x squared times the inverse cosine of x. This is not going to be a chain rule. This is a product rule. These two things are multiplied together. So if I go to find the derivative of y, um, and I'm going to write up the steps just to make real clear what I'm doing. Remember, product rule is derivative of the first one times the second one plus uh, Derivative of the second one times the first one. So as I think about that, derivative of 2x, uh, x squared is 2x, plus um, x squared multiplied by the derivative of inverse cosine of x. My input is x, so it's just, it's just this with, with the x. So negative 1 over square root 1 minus x squared. And since these are multiplied together, and that's negative, I could rewrite this as uh, 2x arc cosine of x. Is that right there? Let's find the derivative of this thing. The derivative of y, y's derivative. So this is a compound function, a function plugged into another function, chain rule. So I need to go derivative of the outside. So for arc sine, it's 1 over the square root of 1 minus whatever that input was squared. Multiplied by, I'm not going to write it out, but the derivative of this. And this is x to the 1 half. 
So the derivative of this is 1 half x to the negative 1 half, right? Bring that down, reduce that by 1. All right, let me clean this up a little bit then. So bottom times bottom. Oh, yeah, uh, I can think of this as that. So I'm going to have 1 over 2 times the square root. Uh, x squared x is just x, and this is the square root of x. So 1 minus x times the square root of x. And since these are both square rooted, I can write this as... Now let's find the derivative of the inverse cosine of 1 over x. So chain rule, function within a side of function. So I'm going to take the um, derivative of inverse cosine, which is this. So negative 1. Remember, this is input squared, and the input's 1 over x. And since it's chain rule, that's going to be multiplied then by the derivative of this. Well, let's clean this up. 1 over x is x to the negative 1. So this could be negative x. Not could be, but is. Uh, to the negative 2 power, right? Bring down the negative 1, decrease this by 1. And this is the same as 1 over x squared. Negative, of course. Negative times the negative is positive. All right, well, you know, I could, I could stop here. This is an okay answer. But um, I might clean it up just a little bit more. Common denominator would be x squared. Notice that the square root of x squared is x, making that an x. Um, x goes into x squared x times, leaving me that. Um, and this is really pretty. Technically, because these are both going to have to be positive, like this was an x squared here and this was an x squared, technically you would say absolute value of x there. If you stop here in this answer, that would be full credit. Um, if you show me this and then go on and give it a try, I, I wouldn't mark you down you know, past this. But it's a good idea to try and simplify them. So I'm going to uh, just set up this problem. I don't want to, I'm not going to solve the whole thing because you have all the tools for it. But I want you to think about how we could set this up. Um, we have some tall thing. It's 500 feet tall. And it, um, this would be kind of the angle of uh, inclination to the sun. And so if I look at this theta, this is an angle that would make like the very top of the, you know, the, the ray that's coming down. To the ground and then this x is the shadow this is some length shadow what i'm hoping to find is the uh the rate of change of the angle relative to the shadow's length relative to how the shadow is changing so what i'm looking for is the change in the angle relative to the change in the shadow it feels at first uh, maybe a little hopeless, but we can use a little trig. One thing I notice is this would be a tangent relationship. I know that the, the tangent of theta opposite over adjacent, 500 over x. So that kind of helps. But I'm not, you know, I want the, I want the change of this relative to x. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to inverse take inverse tangent. So theta would be the inverse tangent of this 500 over x. So then now what I could do is I could take the derivative of both sides. I could take the derivative of this, and that gives me that change in theta relative to the change in the shadow. And then if you gave me a certain value for x, I could tell you what the change is at that value. Of course, after I did the derivative. All right, take your time with these problems. They, um, they take meticulous work. Pay attention to if you're using product rule, or chain rule or quotient rule. Um, sometimes you'll have to use them multiple times. Take your time. I've posted the solutions um, to the homework set by the, by the homework set as well. So look at your answers as you're doing them. Um, and if you don't get it the first time, 
go back and try it again. This, this takes practice. So take your time, do your practice, post questions, uh, help each other. Let me answer and help with it. And, uh, and also have fun with it again. Like this is, this is really rewarding work. I, I really enjoy doing it. And I hope that, uh, I hope that you're getting something out of it too.